So I'd really love to see who you all are. So please um, feel free to go in and enter that information, who you are, where you're from, what your role is with your educational institution. And also, just want to make sure you can all hear us. So if you can, um, whether in the chat or in the question, just uh, let us know you are there. Um, you can also click your attendance box and let us know that um, you are participating. Okay, well, I'm going to, to uh, move forward with this. I think for some reason, I might not be seeing all of your answers. Um, so uh, forgive me if that is the case. I may, I may just have a technical issue on, on my side, but that is all right because we still have a great conversation we can have. So, um, so as we talk about growth and competency and uh, uh, what this might mean, um, reason I'm glad you've joined us today is that growth and competency, developing professional um, learning that is focused on growth and competency really requires a paradigm shift on the, um, on, on, on the part of the system that is delivering it. And this paradigm shift isn't so much in, in terms of the content of the professional development that may be provided, but the paradigm shift really is more around um, the teacher's engagement with it. And so what growth and competency invites us to do is to really flip the equation. Flip the equation so that the teacher is really in charge of their own personal growth and development rather than the system. And traditionally, as you think through it, um, school systems have always been the one who have controlled this experience. So. I'm going to throw up a, uh, an illustration here. Just um, uh, join me for a minute as I describe um, a way that uh, we might consider traditional professional development. So traditional PD really begins first and foremost with the district or the school system determining what the focus is. What PD are we going to provide? So you know, a, a school district can say, hey, this year we're going to focus on rigor in the classroom. We're going to focus on high level question and questioning and inquiry. So a system pro, you know, creates a theme or a focus, um, may even have many of these. Uh, district may determine, we really want to catalog offerings. We're going to have lots of offerings around professional development. But then that school system or district turns around and delivers the PD. Here you go. Here's the workshop, here's the online course, um, here's something to use in your PLC. We're now delivering the professional development. And then the teacher receives this, participates with, within this, and then in the end, there's some sort of evaluative measure. So, um, and that evaluation may be as simple as the teacher gets credit that they have spent seat time at this. You know, they get seat time credit completion credit, maybe a little quiz, maybe a ticket out the door, some sort of reflection. But really through this process, the school system determines what the PD is, determines how the PD is delivered, delivers it to the teacher, and then gives credit or some sort of evaluation at the end. I want you to think about the role of the teacher in this traditional professional development approach. What words might you use to describe um, uh, this teacher's participation. 
and um, typically I would say enter it into the question and answer box, but for whatever reason, I'm not seeing your answers. So, um, so a common response that I get to this when I'm with a group of educators uh, is passive. So think of that. The teacher's role in their own professional development traditionally has been a passive role. Sit and get, just receive. So what happens in passive learning? Well, the, the first and most obvious one is disengagement. And so it's interesting to consider that in our past, you know, 30 years of really trying to refine professional development, we've made so many efforts in so many different domains. But traditionally, PD has continued to be a passive experience on the part of the teacher. So then when we hear reports that say, you know, only two to three percent of the learning that occurs in professional development is actually implemented in the classroom, well, it's, it's not much of a, of a surprise in this passive learning environment. So as we change this, and so, you know, continue with me on this argument here. So if we shift professional development from a, a system-directed approach to really more a teacher-centered approach or a personalized approach to professional development. Well, now, this, this causes us to ask an initial question. And that question fundamentally is, what are the needs of the teacher? And yes, we have done this often. We have different ways of doing this. But when I talk about teacher-centered, I'm really meaning, what are the fundamental needs that that teacher has in their own practice? What are the skills they have? What level of proficiency do they have within those skills? And so I really need to understand the teacher's own performance through this. So who is the teacher? What are their needs? What are their interests? Where is that, you know, how is that teacher's unique learning profile? What is that teacher's unique learning profile? So that in understanding that, I can now think of the teaching standards and those proficiencies. I can think of the content that this teacher is going to engage in. So if we have two teachers who teach next to each other, and let's say it's Miss Smith and Miss Jones, two teachers, um, both of them have been teaching for a few years. Both of them have unique needs. Now, one teacher, Miss Smith, might need class management, help in class management. Ms. Jones might need help in formative assessment, but in a traditional PD approach, well, this year, we're really going to focus on formative assessment. So Ms. Jones is getting the support she needs, but Ms. Smith is not. So even though Ms. Smith may be learning about formative assessment, Ms. Smith doesn't have a lot of opportunity to apply this because her struggle in classroom management continues to disrupt the learning environment. So when we start with understanding who is the teacher and what are the teacher's needs, then we can think about the standards in relation to the teacher versus thinking I have a teaching standard or a competency, I'm going to deliver this and I hope the teacher responds to it. We're more saying how can we use the standards or those teacher proficiencies to define what the teacher's needs are. So now we've established what the teacher's needs are. The next thing that we can consider is choice and accountability. So the interesting thing about adult learners, and uh, you know, as you look at some of the research coming out around this, how do you engage someone in effective learning? How, how do you get them to believe that, yes, this learning matters to me? So it's interesting when you consider my daughter, Maya. She's in second grade now. But when I think about her back in kindergarten, um, you know, it didn't take the teacher a lot of time to convince Maya that the learning they were engaging in mattered for Maya. You know, a uh, teacher starts singing an ABC song, Maya gets engaged in it. Within about a minute, Maya is thinking, yes, the ABCs matter to me. I need to learn this. But as we grow older, each year that we grow older, it takes more effort to convince somebody that the learning that they need to do actually matters to them. So by the time we get to an adult, particularly a professional adult, if adult has not determined on their own, I want to learn this, then it's almost impossible to fully engage them in the learning. So how might this relate to professional development? 
Well, in essence, when we're requiring a teacher to engage in a, a pre-designed professional development, but the teacher has not chosen their participation in this, we're inviting the teacher to disengage from the very learning we hope will occur. So this is where choice and accountability comes into place. Considering adult learners, especially professionals, people who are hired to do this job, they have to have choice within their learning. Now, what's fascinating is that as choice increases, so does accountability. And so think of your own hobby. Personally, uh, you know, one of my favorite hobbies is cooking. I love to cook. I love engaging people in, you know, I, I love cooking a great meal that's creative, that uses interesting ingredients. When I cook and invite, I invite people over to eat, my accountability is sky high. I am intensely worried about how the, my audience, you know, how the people I invited over are going to respond to it. So when choice enters into learning, accountability also enters into learning. If I choose what I engage in to learn, then my accountability matches my choice. So again, as we're going through this, personalized or teacher-centered professional development. Understand who the teacher is and really use those teaching proficiencies or standards to define the teacher's performance. Gives you a target as to where the, the professional learning should be focused. Paired with choice and accountability, I'm giving the teacher, even a struggling teacher, choice in what they're going to learn, what they're going to engage in. And as I give them choice, the teacher has a heightened accountability. Now let's jump over to the other side, a supportive coach and principal. So think about you know, those instructional leaders. I mean, and this could be the principal, a coach, um, a peer advisor, whoever it may be. That other professional that we are assigning to the teacher to help the teacher in their own professional growth. Almost every school system has always assigned an instructional leader to a teacher purely based on hierarchy never based on compatibility. Now think about this for a moment. So we have a whole lot of teachers out there looking to connect with another professional, someone who's going to help inform their practice. But we never think about assigning that instructional leader or that coach based upon the personality of the teacher. Who might that teacher work with best? It's purely, well, you're in this school, you're in this grade, you're, you're teaching the subject, hence the supportive person is already assigned. It's a hierarchy assignment. And so we're not using that as a leverage. We're not looking and seeing who is the particular individual who, who might most support this teacher in their growth. They're going to connect them also, you know, the, the similar experiences, similar background. And so as we center professional development to the teacher, we really have to think about who is that supportive coach or principal assigned to help that teacher. Do we know that these two get along, that this is going to be a productive relationship? And finally, we get to the lower left there, culture and relevancy. And, it, and it's, um, you know, despite all of our effort to talk about um, cultural proficiency and cultural relevancy in terms of student learning, who are the students? What's their background? What do they come with? You know, what experiences have informed them to this point? And we're going to tailor the learning to really reflect who that student is. We've never done this within professional development. And so if I have two teachers that I'm trying to support and one teacher loved school, always did well in it and always got good grades and has a natural disposition to trust what the system provides, well, that's a particular form of professional development I'm going to provide that teacher. But if I have another teacher who comes from a different background, working in a culturally different environment than what they grew up in, maybe did not have a good schooling experience and tends to distrust the system. Well, I can tailor the professional learning to that teacher's needs. I can make the professional learning culturally relevant to the teacher, which if it helps students to do that, then it's easy to conclude it's likely going to help a teacher as well. So I just want you to think about this a minute. I, I really present all of this as a way of, of reframing our approach to professional development. 
how can we change the system so that as a teacher comes in with a particular need, they're engaging in a professional development system that is attuned to their personalized requirements. So this teacher is going to get the support they need. It's focused on, on where they are ready to learn. They're working with colleagues they connect with, and it's really reflective of who that teacher is. You know, by designing this type of system, we can really energize professional development. So rather than a 3% implementation rate, we're getting a much higher implementation rate on the part of the educators who are participating in this. So this is really, in a sense, the, the, um, the hope and drive of a growth and competency system. So as I walk through a growth and competency system, how is it that we've oriented it? I, I want you to keep this, this teacher-centered or personalized approach to professional development in mind. So let's move through this. So here's the key, the key question. This should be the driving question in any type of professional development that is delivered. Can you actually do it? Can you do it? And so so as we work through this, if, if the key question that guides the design of professional development is can you actually do it, then we have to shift to a skills orientation around professional development rather than a concept orientation. And what I mean by this is you know, differentiation is a pedagogical approach to be used in the classroom. But differentiation is a concept. In order to succeed at differentiation, there's a whole bevy of skills that the teacher needs in order to actually differentiate the instruction. Some of these skills are formative assessment, lesson design, um, you know, particular strategies that can be used, grouping, um, integrating the curriculum. All of these are much more specific skills that when applied together really uh, show implementation of the concept of differentiation. But PD traditionally has been focused conceptually, kind of broad, larger themes. Classroom management. Classroom management in and of itself is not a skill, but it's a collection of many skills and competencies. And so if we can shift the professional development to focus in on the more finite skills that a teacher needs to apply in the classroom, well, we will start to see much more effectiveness in terms of the teacher now applying the learning. Our efficiencies in professional development will skyrocket. So I wanna use a little illustration here because we have to determine what is a skill. And so this is, uh, just bear with me as, as we watch through this, this little video here about, um, about blowing bubble gum. I'm just going to go ahead and hit play here. So this is a simple video that I found on YouTube about how to blow a great bubble. Now you notice through this, this is very straightforward. This is explicitly about how you blow a great bubble when chewing gum. It's not about the history of chewing gum. So that video there as you watch it, explicitly about the skill of blowing gum. It's not about the history of blowing gum. It's not about the history of gum. It's not about competitions that are out there. It's not about bubble gum in the news. That entire video was explicit to the idea of the skill of blowing a bubble with gum. I watched through it. It's giving me, what? Sorry, um, just realized that we've got another video playing. Let me pause that there. Um, the joy of, of using an internet during a webinar. So, but the reason why I'm using bubble gum is that it's illustrative of skill level development. I can watch that video and in 30 seconds, I've already informed myself of how I can blow a better bubble. Blowing a bubble with gum is a skill. So the next question I would ask you is, how do you know whether or not you've actually learned this skill? Again, if I could, if the system was working, I could see your answers. 
Oh, there we go. Okay, I'm finally seeing everybody. Um, okay, so now I get to ask you all questions. Um, sorry that my, my GoToWebinar platform was not letting me see your responses. And that's it. So quickly, type in the answer box. We all just watched a video on how to blow a bubble. How do I know whether or not you have learned that skill? What will I see if I know you have learned the skill of blowing a bubble? Take a minute to respond. Okay, so Tani writes in and says, I will demonstrate blowing a bubble. Um, Jason writes in and says, when your teacher yells at you and tells you to stop blowing bubbles and chewing gum in class. So Jason, I'm going to take that from you're actually seeing someone blow a bubble. Jan says, demonstration of blowing bubbles. Patty says, I will actually be able to blow a bubble successfully. Um, Jessica says, I, I'll be able to blow a bubble without having to think about it. Um, Denise said, I just blew a bubble. I could take a picture and send it. Awesome. Well done. So, you know, Gordon says, you'd have to see my bubble. I would have to show you. This is the beauty of skills. It's evidence-based. And so when we focus the learning on a specific skill, we're able to measure the implementation of that skill based on the evidence we can actually see. So how does this relate to, um, sorry, my, sorry about this. And now we're replaying the bubble. I'm just going to go ahead and close that out. There we go. Um, sorry again, uh, my internet is actually live. So, let me click forward here. So when we talk about professional growth and competency, we always begin with the big idea of mastery of practice. You know, we really are. I mean, the only reason to engage in, in professional development is so that teachers can become masters of their practice. You know, master educators who really can just, you know, hold those, those students in the palm of their hands and engender the learning that students need. And so that's always the, the overarching purpose of what we're doing. That is the umbrella of growth and competency. And the next step in this is competency of standards. So personally, all of us have experienced this truly master educator. And when I'm with groups of educators, I usually say, how many of them did you have? Most educators will say that in their own experience, they've had between about one and three truly master educators that they have experienced. But how do we formally define what a master educator looks like? Well, that's where the teaching standards come into play. And I know that teaching standards have also been used for evaluation, so they've been beat up a little bit. But take evaluation out of the equation. And when you read the standards, what the standards really are asking for, the standards define performance. So what is a standard? It, it, it causes me to pose this question right now. What is a standard? And um, a standard is, in essence, a measurement of performance. The analogy that I often use with this is a football game. So, you know, and, and please, you know, if you want to type into the answer box there, share what, a, what the standard of football is. So how do I know if a team is performing in football? I'm watching a football game, and I've now seen evidence or proof that a team has met the standard. But well, when a team in football meets the standard, they make a goal, they make points, they cross the goal line. So the standard in football is a hundred yard field. When the ball has moved all the way to the goal line, it's basically completed that hundred yard distance, a team gets points. So crossing the goal line in football is a standard of performance based on that hundred yard measurement. Now, the interesting thing is, here in Utah, where I'm uh, speaking from today, 
our football fields are 100 yards long. Jason, who I happen to know, who's in Florida, Florida's football fields are 100 yards long. There's a consistent standard of performance in football so that when I walk into a football game and I'm watching it, I know when any team has scored because they've met that standard of performance. The ball has moved across the goal line. It's completed that 100-yard distance. So teaching standards, in essence, perform the same function. Standards are a measurement of performance. To be clear with this, standards are not curriculum. Now, often we will reference, you know, our state learning standards as curriculum, but really what that standard is asking is, what can a child or a student actually do upon learning the curriculum? The curriculum is more like the plays that occur on the football field. So the standard performance in football is ball crosses the goal line, points are made. Now, whether the play is messy or the play is clean, it doesn't matter. The standard of performance has been met. Whether one coach decides to run a particular play and another coach decides to run a different play, that's like two teachers having their own curriculum sets. The curriculum can change and vary according to the needs of the students, but the performance standard is going to remain consistent teaching standards are the same. So when I read through the teaching standards, it's defining for me what I, I will see a master teacher do in the classroom. So those are standards. Standards define this mastery of practice. But the standards can be broke down to evidence-based skills. So just like you know, if I think about some standards, there's too much evidence that I need to find in order to see its proficiency. But if I think about a skill, just like that bubble gum blowing, I will see you actually blow a bubble. Now I have witnessed your performance to a standard. Um, so as we move through this, you know, as we think about mastery teaching standards and competencies, skills-based evidence, I want to talk a moment about skills. And what does a skill really look like? So as you can see here, this is a picture of my two children. This is Dominic, my son, who is now 11, and Maya, my daughter, who is seven. And so this photo here is from last summer. We are traveling up in Yellowstone, you know, in Salt Lake City, so not too far from Yellowstone. And that particular morning, we went to a spot in Yellowstone called the Boiling River. And you hike up next to this river, and you come to this spot where um, you know, some of the steaming water is running into a cold mountain, mountain river. And so the hot water, the cold water mixes together. People use rocks to build up almost like little hot tubs. And you climb into the river, and the cold water passes you, you get into the warm spot, and it's just awesome. Awesome morning with my kids. We had so much fun. So we finally get out of these, you know, little natural hot tubs and we're walking back down the trail and my son discovers this tree that's hanging out over the river. He looks at it and goes, huh, I think I am good enough to walk out to the end of that. He's thinking of his skill of balance. So what does my son do? He starts walking out on the limb. Now as a parent, of course, I can make a choice at that moment and say, no, don't do that but remember choice and accountability. He's already decided at this moment, I want to prove my skill, so I'm going to go do this. Well, of course, my daughter sees it, and she says, huh, maybe I have a skill in balance as well. I'm also going to do this. Now think about so many of you have watched children engage in a task or a skill that they choose. The only option for my two kids when they entered out on this limb was to succeed. There was no other option. If I was to step in in any way and say, don't do it, they push back. No, dad, I can do this. I can do this. So when a child tries to complete something totally of their own choice, they're out in the backyard playing, whatever it may be, the child's only choice in this is success. They will keep practicing the skill until they have mastered it, just like my two kids. Neither of them were going to come off that limb 
until they could stand firmly with their own balance. And of course, you can see it in their faces. They were having a grand old time. They loved this. They were learning. They were practicing the skill, but it was natural. They were naturally engaged within this. So that's a skill. So then we have to ask the question, well, how do we define the skills of teaching? So as we move through this, remember this, this, um, this hierarchy of mastery of practice, which is defined by a standard or a competency, and those standards or competencies break down into skills. So if we think about how this might be illustrated, so you know, we, uh, a mastery practice might be the supportive classroom learning environment, which is defined by a standard of a safe and respectful learning community and effective classroom management. Well, if we look at the standard of a safe and respectful learning community, well, that breaks down into certain skills. And this is just the sampling of skills. Obviously, there are far more skills that go along with this. So in order to run a safe and respectful learning community, I have to think about my interactions, you know, student-teacher interaction, student-to-student -student interaction. Likewise, collaboration becomes one of these skills. Can I manage and, and effectuate good collaboration in the classroom? Norms and values. You know, uh, that's a skill for me as a teacher to implement in my classroom. As I implement norms and values, it creates this safe and respectful learning community. Again, you can see that, that these are additive. And so your more finite skills add up to a standard which adds up to this mastery of practice. If we look at effective classroom management, well, effective classroom management is dependent upon the skill of routines and procedures. Can I run routines and procedures, you know, and, and manage those each day? High expectations. Um, likewise, interventions, you know, if, uh, a, a effective interventions are truly a skill within effective classroom management. Can I intervene at the moment when a, when a child is acting out? So this is hierarchical. I mean, this is additive. You know, the, the, the skills are nested within the standards. The standards are nested within this mastery of practice. So most states have released a set of teaching standards. And this is just an example of one state that I was recently in, looking at the standard of learning environment. So as I consider this, I look through this, and there's really good stuff here. As I think about... Defining a teacher's performance, I can look at this set of standards and say, yeah, I mean, this really does define what I would see in a good learning environment. But the challenge is, this is quite high level. This doesn't give me a lot of guidance in terms of the learning that a teacher needs to engage. Remember, this is the difference between the standard performance, I know a football team has scored by crossing that goal line, but then there's a thousand different plays that can occur which allow the team to actually get to the goal line. So we're looking at a set of standards here, but I haven't yet defined the learning a teacher needs to engage in in order to perform at this standard. Now, many states have also created rubrics. And what the rubrics provide is, is a bit more detail around, well, what might I see in the classroom? You know, there's, there's more detail here. So as we get deeper into the detail, you know, through rubrics and whatnot, as we think of these state teaching standards, we're able to start seeing more clearly those competencies and standards. But still, as I look at this rubric, we're still not to the skill level. So we've remained in the zone of being a little too high level for the sake of good, efficient professional learning on the part of the teacher that's, that's really personalized to their needs. So, as we've looked at this here at School Improvement Network, um, we've really used the in-task teaching standards as kind of our, our central repository. And so what I'm going to present you from now, um, from here on out, is really based on the in-task um, teaching standards. The reason we use in-task is that in-task is a set of teaching standards that has been supported and adopted by pretty much every state in the U.S. Now they are crosswalked to the more specific state standards, such as the Georgia Keys and whatnot. So, but but the the in task is almost like a Rosetta Stone of the standards. It's it's a it's a central repository of these standards that more localized teaching standards are based upon. It just gives us a central place to work. So as I look at the in task standards, and if I'm to break this apart, now I want your responses on this. Okay, so if I start with 
a standard on learning environments. And if you read through the standard, it says the teacher works with others to create environments that support individual and collaborative learning and that encourage positive social interaction, active engagement in learning, and self-motivation. Definitely written like a standard. Good information there. You know, really tells me, yes, this would be a beautiful learning environment. But here's my question for you. Please respond in the answer box. If I'm an instructional leader and I'm working with a teacher and I ask the teacher, so how long would it take you to master this standard? If I'm going to come back, you're going to invite me back in your classroom so I can observe your practice and I can see mastery of the standard. How much time do you as a teacher need to master the standard? So there's your question. How much time do you as a teacher need to master this standard? So as you read through the standard, how much time would you as a teacher need to master this standard? So Gordon writes in and says, uh, between one and six months, two semesters even. So two semesters. So, you know, a longer period of time. Um, Jessica writes in and says, as a student and a new teacher in the future, so you are on this path right now, Jessica, you'd say at least two years. There'd be a lot of learning to do. Okay, so think through this. Stephanie says six months. We kind of have this range between about six months and two years. That's typical with a standard because it's broad. It's more abstracted. Um, it takes more effort to try to master it. Okay, so the in-task breaks standards down into teacher indicators. So in task is recognizing, you know, these teaching standards recognizing the standard may be too broad to really define a teacher's engage, professional learning engagement. So it breaks it down into teacher indicators. So the teacher indicator one for this particular learning environment standard says, teacher collaborates with others to build a positive learning climate marked by respect, rigor, and responsibility. Teacher indicator two says, teacher manages the learning environment to engage learners actively. Okay, so now we've broken it down a little bit further. So just taking teacher indicator one, same question for you. If you, rather than thinking of the standard, if I say, you know, if I'm your instructional leader, I'm supporting you, I want you to really master teacher indicator one. Teacher collaborates with others to build a positive learning climate marked by respect, rigor, and responsibility. You were saying that with the standard, you need six months to two years to master it. How much time might you need to master indicator one? It's a more finite look at the standard. How much time? And Denise, I do have to credit what you say. Denise says, some can master these things quickly. Others are still working them after 25 years without question. I think this is one of the challenges we face by, by looking too much just at that standard. It is, it is, it's asking too much. But so if you break it down to indicator one, teacher collaborates with others to build a positive learning climate, respect, rigor, responsibility. How much time might be needed? Jessica says, half of the time of the original answer. Okay, so we've now cut the time to mastery in half because we've narrowed the expected practice. Um, uh, Gordon writes in and says, with the proper master teacher working with the new teachers, change could take place in one month. Okay, so now, I mean, down to a month. Um, Patty says maybe a few weeks of working collaboratively depends on the personalities. Okay, so now we've we've shifted our frame. We've said rather than thinking in these broad timelines of six months to two years, we're now thinking, you know, a few weeks to a couple of months. Okay, this this seems more chewable. More, you know, it's like I could bite this off and possibly go after this. That's still a long time when you think about how much happens in a classroom over two months. It's a lot of time. So what we've been working on is we've been trying to break this down even further. And so I'm next going to take you into a, a, a skills pathway on positive learning climate. 
that is more finite. So again, you know, because I'm focusing on indicator one here, teacher club says build a positive learning climate. Now let's look at the positive learning climate C, which could actually be a micro credential. So as I look at this, so this is our skills pathway for a positive learning climate. I can think about those skills that are nested within that particular competency of a positive learning climate. Setting classroom expectations, skill, teacher communication, teacher-student communication, student collaboration, student-to-student -student communication. Okay, so these are all specific skills that I as a teacher can work on in mastering this positive learning climate. Let's just go to student collaboration. And so if I look at the very specific skill of student collaboration, if I'm a beginning teacher, you know, and, and I am showing an effort at trying to get students to collaborate, the evidence you would see, remember, seeing the bubble that is blown or seeing, you know, seeing the point that is made. The evidence that I would see is that as a teacher, I'm permitting learning focus interactions among the learners. So look at that beginning column for student collaboration. Teacher permits learning focus interactions among learners. As I grow in my proficiency, um, proficient application of student collaboration be teacher provides structures for learners to support each other in their learning. So in the first class I walk in, so let's say this is Ms. Smith. I'm seeing Ms. Smith invite students to collaborate around the learning. Okay, kids, now talk about what you just read. Okay, so there is evidence of collaboration, but Ms. Smith saying talk about what you just read. When I go into Ms. Jones class, she's saying use a think pair share to talk about what you read. There's a difference there in the evidence that we're seeing. At a beginning level, I'm seeing a teacher begin this particular skill of student collaboration. At a proficient level, I'm seeing the teacher apply structure to this collaboration. And then if I go into Ms. Thomas's class and, I, and, and she's really distinguished at student collaboration, well, Ms. Thomas is providing structures and time for learners to share and discuss each other's ideas and thoughts about the concept or curriculum. So Ms. Thomas is not only adding structure to the collaboration, she's really adding focus to the dialogue. You know, she's, she's helping students hone in on the key concepts. And so as you look at the skills pathway, it's developmental. As I master one part of the skill, then I can add to you know my proficiency in it as a teacher i can grow through this skill so going back to the same question if you said it was six months to two years for me to master the standard and you know in a, in a few weeks to a couple of months to be able to master that indicator if i go in and i look at miss smith's class and I say miss smith you really are helping you know you're inviting students to collaborate but where you can really work on your particular skill is in implementing collaborative structures. So, you know, learning about a think pair share or KWL or whatever it may be, you know, collaborative structure. So how much time might, might it be? Or let's say instead of Ms. Smith, it's me. You're sharing with me. You know, the, the development of your skill is really based upon you learning how to how to provide collaborative structures. So I'm trying to move from that beginning level on student collaboration to the proficient level. How much time might I need to master growth in that skill? How much time? You know, you're saying, when should I come back and see you implementing this? How much time might I need to be able to grow and show development within this skill? Very specific to student collaboration from beginning to proficient. So Jessica says, if you start to work on it immediately, you can do that within a few weeks. Cleanly, yeah. Anyone else? So when you think about mastering a skill, instead of in the timeline of months or even years, we really get down uh, to a matter of weeks, if not a week. Gordon says it's a new muscle that needs to be developed. Every teacher is different, constant change, two to three weeks. Okay, think about how much efficient
efficiency we have now discovered in this professional development. When we're able to frame it down to the level of a skill, we're inviting the teacher to rapidly learn, quickly practice, keep working at it, and really master its application thinner, a matter of a week to a couple of weeks. So as your instructional leader, if I'm coming in every week, you know, next week when I come in, I'm going to see measurable progress. As a teacher, instead of looking at the development of, of you know, my teaching proficiencies as this long drawn out process, as a teacher, I'm now quickly taking on my needs. You know, as a teacher, I really want my students to be able to collaborate, but I'm always frustrated because the moment I prompt my students to collaborate, the classroom kind of falls apart. I lose control of my classroom. Okay, so within a week to two weeks, I'm now following that up with a collaborative structure. You know what? Collaboration is going better in my classroom. I'm now believing as a teacher in my own sense of self-efficacy. I can do better in my practice. Now, what's the next thing I can take on? This is the power of really shifting, um, shifting professional development down to this skills focus. Why? Because skills can be quickly learned and practiced, and there's evidence of their application. So it's not just my knowledge. It may be one thing if I can define for you what a PL, you know, what a think pair share is. It's a whole different thing for my classroom if I can actually do a think pair share. And so it's that evidence nature of skills. I can see you do it and I can refine, you know, I, I can help you refine your practice based upon what I am seeing. That's where we really get the power of skills-based professional development. So I hope this makes sense. I mean, this is, this is in, in, in our approach as we've been looking at this, we really feel that this changes the nature, this changes the paradigm of professional development because we're no longer talking about what teachers need to learn we're talking about, well, what skills are teachers applying? What are they doing in their classrooms? So how does this learning process actually take place? How do we empower it? Well, this is our, our growth and competency system or cycle. So it begins by focusing in on the skill competency or you know, the skill which is nested within the competencies and the standards. So the first step of this process is a set. I need to know where a teacher's performance is. Remember, as you're analyzing my own performance, my, the assessment would point out that I'm prompting my students to collaborate, but I'm not then engaging them in a collaborative structure. So the assessment takes place, a, a, a pre-assessment. That assessment determines the learning I'm now going to engage in. Okay, my need for learning is in implementing collaborative structures in the classroom. So I want to go out and I want to learn about a think pair share or some other you know, strategy, whatnot, that's a collaborative structure. I mean, this is where you know, Edivate our tool, whatnot comes in. I can watch a video of a teacher doing this. I can learn about it. Well, we start with the assessment. I need to learn how to do collaborative structures. I now engage in learning. Now I know what collaborative structures look like. Well, the next natural step in this is practice. Okay, I'm now going to step into my classroom and I'm going to try to do a think pair share. First time doesn't go well. Well, of course, usually most skills when we try to use them the first time, it doesn't go perfectly. So I retry it and I refine it and I do it again and I do it again and I keep refining and I get my peer to give me feedback on it. And eventually, as I'm kind of going back through the cycle, every time that I apply or I practice this skill, I'm once again engaging in a formative assessment. How is it going? What else do I need to learn? What else do I need to try and apply? And so this is a cyclical process. Assess, learn, practice. Assess, learn, practice. Assess, learn, practice. As my assessment, my formative assessment is showing, yes, I am doing this well. You know what? And, and as you go back to that skills chart, um, you know, as, as you look at this, Okay, now I am showing great proficiency across these skills within this pathway of a positive learning, learning climate. I'm setting classroom expectations. I am, I've become really proficient at my communication, teacher communication, teacher student communication. The collaboration is great. You know what? At this point, as I've been going through this process of assess, learn, practice, 
The next thing I'm ready for is to show mastery. This is where things such as badges and micro-credentials come into play. And so as a teacher, one of the things that, that education as an industry is really missed is in recognizing excellent skill on the part of professional educators. What a micro-credential does is it assesses the competencies a teacher has and gives them a certificate or a recognition of their actual practice in the classroom. You have performed at standard. You have built a beautiful, positive learning climate. You have evidence that backs it up. You're a master teacher at this particular competency. When teachers are able to get this recognition, well, now they become peer, you know, peer leaders, teacher leaders, whatnot. It gives us an opportunity to really recognize the skills that certain teachers have and to be able to broadcast that and give them opportunities to share their skills with their peers. The other piece that, that comes into play in this is, is, is evaluation. Uh, so many states now formal evaluation processes. We have to respect that that is implemented. It's in place. Well, when teachers trust this growth and competency system, we can now start to incorporate some of the data gathered through the evaluation process to inform this, this growth process. So this is really what professional growth and competency looks like. And, you know, in School Program Network, we're really trying to to align the resources we provide educators so it supports this process. You know, our observe tool in terms of the assessment, the Edivate content in terms of learning, um, Edivate review and Edivate groups, you know, that really support that practice and implementation, and the micro-credentials that allow teachers to say, I'm a master at this particular competency. It's an exciting time. I mean, I, I must say, um, it's really exciting for us to be able to help systems start to implement this. So I just want to end on one quick little story. And, and I know that I've been talking for a while. Um, we're at the end of our hour and I want to, you know, answer any questions you might have. And so this is, this is a quantum leap. I wanted to, you know, uh, uh, define what a quantum leap is, illustrating this with Mogadishu, Somalia. So quantum leap is when, you know, a culture or society or a system does a rapid jump in terms of its advance, its technological advance or its progress. You know, it, it leaps over many steps, you know, slow steps of progress. So Mogadishu, Somalia. Well, if you know anything about Somalia, it is literally an anarchic state. There's no national government that's recognized in Somalia. They don't have, you know, a representative of the UN and whatnot. It's really a country that's kind of been broken apart and is governed by warlords. Mogadishu, which is the largest city, you could almost call it the capital city of Somalia, is a place where you know, these warlords have been running the city for many, many years now. And so I was hearing this interview with, with a, a war zone reporter, and this was on NPR. And the interviewer on NPR was talking to this reporter and saying, you know, gosh, you're in these places like, you know, like Somalia, how do you actually communicate back home? How do you turn your stories in? The interviewer was assuming there's no real technology in place in a place like Mogadishu. And the reporter says, you know, you'd be shocked, but the best connectivity, digital connectivity on earth is actually in Mogadishu, Somalia. And the interviewer goes, you gotta be kidding me. I mean, it's, it's, it's a war zone. How could it have better connectivity, you know, to the internet and all the rest than any place else? And, and, and this war zone reporter says, you gotta believe it. I mean, I have better cell phone, connectivity, I can upload video, download it, Skype, whatever, anywhere in the city, it's incredible. The interviewer says, how did this actually happen? And this reporter says that prior to them implementing a brand new communication system, Mogadishu did not have a legacy communication system. There wasn't functioning telephone lines. There weren't these old communication systems that have been in place for years, such as we have you know, here in the States and elsewhere. So a warlord basically went to Alcatel, the French company that sets up these cellular networks and says, I want the best network. Paid for it within a few months. They put the towers up. Suddenly Mogadishu has the best internet connectivity of any place on earth. That's a quantum leap. They went from no connectivity to the best connectivity in a short time frame. This, I believe, is the promise of a growth and competency system. When we scale the learning down to skills, we really think about evidence in practice. 
And so we engender teachers within this cycle of growth, rapid growth towards competency. We're going to see a quantum leap in a teacher's sense of self-efficacy. I can handle this classroom. I can quickly work on the skills I need so that my teaching becomes better, my student engagement becomes better, and ultimately we succeed as a classroom. So it's, it's an exciting time to think about this, to think about supporting every single teacher to this master level of practice. Um, I really appreciate the time that you have given us today. And I have a couple of questions here. Um, so Denise asks, can you talk to us about the, what the process of facilitation will look like? Timelines, prices, contact personnel. It is a great question, Denise. Um, I ask that you send me personally your contact information. Let me follow up with you on this, okay? This is the functionality piece of this is rolling out this summer for back to school next year. Um, but it's, it's a more involved conversation, obviously, than a webinar can provide. But Denise, if you can send me your your contact information, um, we will reach out to you so we can walk you through this. Um, Tammy says, can you show us the circle of the process again? Yes, let me let me click back to that. So there you go. That's um, I'm assuming, Tammy, this is what you were asking for. Um, are there any other questions? Uh, I will hang on for a few minutes in case any other questions come through. If any of you are leaving now, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I really uh, appreciate the time you've given us, and I hope it's been informative. Gordon, thank you as well for participating. So um, truly, I hope you have a great day, and I look forward to continuing this conversation. Like I said, I'll hang around for a few minutes for additional um, questions that you might have. Hey, thanks, Curtis. This is Todd Franks again, guys. I uh, just want a, a quick reminder to share a quick reminder. This uh, webinar has been recorded and we will be sending you, uh, everyone, a link to a recording of this webinar. So if you attended and registered, uh, you will be getting that in an email from School Improvement Network. So be sure and look for that. And thank you once again for attending and, and taking time out of your busy schedule to join in with us today. Thank you all, and I look forward. Please watch for the notice as well. We'll have additional webinars that follow up on this, and um, we're going to go deeper into this process. So thank you all.